my name's Dave. Dave Hodgson, The Daily. It's definitely Dave. Uh, good afternoon, you're listening to TRE Talk Radio Europe, and now we're going to go live to the UK, in London in particular, and uh, speak to Mark Dempster, who is an addiction therapist. Good afternoon, uh, Mark, how are you? Hello, Dave. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, good. Well, what's the weather like in sunny old London, though? Well, it... it's it's a bit um, it's it's a bit rainy at the moment. Uh, it was it was sunny over the weekend, but you know you know what it's like. It's England, <laughs> isn't it? So it's uh, not quite as bad as Scotland, but it's uh, still a bit bleak. I was really, going to say time of year. that you haven't got like a, a Cockney accent. You're, you're up the apples and pears yeah. and all that. So uh, where no, are you originally from? No. <laughs> Do you know, and it's funny because I've been here for such a long time. I've lived in London for 20 odd, I mean, 28 years, 29 wow. years. So it's, I've lived here longer than, than I did in Scotland. That, that's, yeah, but you don't lose your Scotish accent, do you? Surely. No, no not, at all, one, you not at all. Not uh, at all. Mark, no. yeah, now you've got this uh, a, a book called Nothing to Declare. Great title, by the way. And yeah. <laughs> just um, tell us a little bit about. What, what all, how it all went wrong for you and uh, just how that journey started for you and how you got caught up in drugs. Right, OK. I mean, it's a long... It's, obviously, it's a long story. The book, the book also, Dave, is called Nothing to Declare, uh, Confessions of an Unsuccessful Drug Smuggler, Dealer and Addict. And I think that's... The unsuccessful part is important yeah. to... Um, uh, how... I mean, I came from a family of, of addiction. My father was an alcoholic... Uh, my father really also was a petty criminal, and some of his, his my father's side of the family were were sort of petty criminals, and um, so it was quite criminality was quite normalised for me as a child. Yeah. Uh, also, was obviously exposed to a lot of alcoholism, um, and 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 it was you know as a child too because of my father's alcoholism, I was left around a lot, and you know I, I guess as. As a child, I started to gravitate to people. I was trying to find love or approval from later on the, the wrong groups of people. So I started to gravitate to people who were also criminals and who who were using drugs. And um, and of course, I thought that was cool. I wanted to be part of the cool well, gang. Can I and, just jump in there and ask you, yeah. Mark? Because we we get this question a lot when we talk to people yeah. like you, or if we're talking about young people in general. And that is that uh, you know you, people say, well, I was brought up in in a in a in a culture where uh, there was yeah. crime and it was prevalent. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. the middle of all that, do you still know right and wrong? Do you know that what you were doing was wrong, even though uh, you were brought up yeah. with that as a norm? Yeah, I think I see. I think you do. I think of, I think you do. Of course you do, because my mother, my, my mother's side was she was a Catholic. You know, she was mm. like. You know, we'd go to chapel and, you know, so she was quite a religious lady. So at the time, so I did know that that was, um, you know, the, the wrong thing. My father, but, but of course, it was just, there was something in me that was really attracted to that sort of, de- and, and I, that sort of danger and that excitement. And uh, and I think that's all really part of the addiction process as well. Yeah. I think once you take away the drugs and alcohol, you've got to do a lot of deeper work and you've got to look at some of the early behaviours and, and child, you know, like to start to really explore, you know, some of the stories that you create about yourself and about life as a whole. Uh, it, what's interesting about this, Dave, is I was actually in that prison just down the road from in Malaga prison in the 80s, that wow. Alarin prison. Yes. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. When I was listening to the adverts there, I was thinking, God... I went there and, uh, you know, because I, I was taking drugs out of Spain. There was cannabis that used to come in, or oh, still probably does, from Morocco. And, and uh, I was bringing uh, that Morocco hash back yeah. to England and I got caught. And, and I wound up in that jail for six months. So, so, you, met... so you were receiving drugs from Morocco and Spain's a place to come and collect it to take it into the, into the UK? England, to take it to England, yeah. They, they, cause, and what, what was happening was I was meeting, I, I met I met a whole group of people when I was in prison who were, of course, they were sort of heavyweights really who were who were bringing in lots of drugs. This is back in the 80s when there was a, you know, there was um, that whole coast, the Marbella, yeah. Fuengarola, there was, there was a lot of, I guess there was a lot of ex-criminals that had went, came from England and were settled there mm. and there was uh, and there was a lot of people involved in bringing Moroccan, you know, hash from Morocco across to Spain, 
and, uh, and, and so that one of the dormitories in, in Allerin Prison was just full of English. It was just full of English, wow. Scottish and Irish. Yeah, it's interesting in the 80s, yeah. And, um, of course, it, and, and how did... It, the, the thing about it, Dave, is I, I, I never intended to, you know, become a drug dealer or, or you know, d- d- import drugs from country to country or any of that, but in the throes of addiction when you when you become addicted to these drugs especially the, the class A drugs later on your your whole willpower is almost taken it because it's an interesting synopsis how people see it is that often they view people with addictions as having very weak wills or having a a sort of moral a moral dilemma yeah. or the, the moral compass needs adjusted or but, but often what what I find with working with a lot of clients with addictions is that actually the will is very... It, it's not the, weak, the will that's weak, it's actually the will that's really misdirected. They've got often got very strong wills, and that's the problem. Hmm. But the will's misdirected in the wrong, in the wrong area, do you know? And, yeah, um, so, and so really you're not working... You actually, the, your will's working against you rather than for you in, in many ways. Mm, mm, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm just interested to know because you said you're in Allerin prison here, and uh, yeah. uh, have, have you been in prison other places as well? Or was it just this? Yeah, and, and and I was in Belmarsh prison here in London just before I got clean. I was in Belmarsh prison. I was going to ask you because was, sorry, yeah. Go, yeah, go on. I was going to say quickly, Mark. That was while you're in prison, are, are, in your mindset, are you thinking, you know what, I don't want to be here again, so I need to get my life sorted out, or are you meeting people and thinking, planning what you're going to do when you get out in order to make some more money? <laughs> We'll see there's, there's a combination of different things, isn't it? You're, you're right. There's, 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 you're surrounded by people who are also criminals, obviously. So you're, so you're getting ideas as, as a, as a sort of criminal yourself or a drug addict or you know a drug dependent. You're, you're, you're getting a lot of ideas and, and possible opportunities. So you're around people that can provide you various opportunities as well. So that's in the backdrop. But however, there is also this. By the by, the end of my drug use, when I was in Belmarsh Prison, because I'd hit a rock bottom, and I mean, like I'd had a, a physically, I felt at a rock bottom. Like I couldn't physically, I felt as if I couldn't keep continuing. My, my body couldn't cope yeah. with the drugs that I was taking. Psychologically as well, I felt that I, I had a rock bottom. That I was having suicidal ideation. That they they had, I see addiction as an illness. I, like it's recognised in America as an illness and a progressive illness and it's under the, the DSM-5 category like gambling is as well as called a, gambling's a disorder so it's a mental looked at as a mental illness I think drug and alcoholism drug addiction and alcoholism is the same and so by the time I was in prison and at the end of my drug use because of the physical rock bottom the psychological and the spiritual rock bottom too where you just feel you know completely indifferent towards yourself and people in general yeah. I I was getting to I thought you know I can't go on like this uh, I need to stop but of course what you need is you need to find people who have done it you need to find people who have walked this path that can guide you to or, or because your self esteem is so smashed you're so on the floor really and you, and you don't you have no confidence that you could achieve complete sobriety or so you know, you need help. You need to find people that either professionals or people that have, that are in recovery that can help you get clean. And I, I just want to say, the self help groups are really important for this. I know that in Fuengarola, there's there's a good there's some self help groups. You know, in, yeah. in Fuengarola, uh, and and I'm sure there will be in Marbella as well. So, what was I'm the just thinking for you? What yeah. was the main? Yeah, in fact, yeah. If anybody, yeah, that'd be great for people to uh, look that up as yeah. well. If they're in a similar situation, um, what was the turning point for you? What was the point when you said, "Right, that's it now. Enough's enough. This has to change." Was there one particular turning point, or was it just general? Well, yeah. Well, I think this is, it's an interesting one because because I was in St Thomas's. Um, just near the near the end of my drug use, I was uh, a friend of mine had HIV, and um, uh, the long and short was he used to get his medication because back in the eighties uh, or the early nineties, people were prescribed um, 
they were prescribed diamorphine if they had HIV, often because of the pain. And and my friend was uh, prescribed diamorphine. Anyway, he I was in St Thomas's Hospital. He gave me some of his diamorphine. I injected it in the toilet and I, and I overdose, a sort of not not overdose, but I I went out cold. Yeah. And then when I came when I when I came to what had happened is somebody had turned the light off in the toilet, but I didn't know that they turned the light off in the toilet. I thought I'd went blind, right? And and it was only like so I was on this toilet seat. I came to from this from this sort of injection of heroin, and then uh, I, I sort of came, I, I thought, God, I'm blind, you know? And I freaked out. And then I seen there was a light at the bottom of the. the then I looked around and yeah. I seen there was a light at the bottom of the thing. So anyway, but in that toilet. On that night, I had a, a, a rock bottom. I just thought, I cannot go on. And I actually asked, I'm not religious, and, you know, I, I, I guess I'm more spiritual, really, but I, I asked for something outside. I said, look, I can't do this anymore. I need I need help. Uh, I just, you know, I, I guess I prayed, really. I, I prayed to something. And and, uh, and what was interesting about that was a couple of within a couple of months I got put in prison for in Belmarsh and it was it was and that was the beginning of the whole process. So I never got like a divine light intervention like uh, some sort of drug worker showing up the next day that would help me, but there was a sequence of events that happened to me. Well, whether that, that was connected or not. That's something I've come across. My other job is I'm a minister of the church, so I've come across that as well, uh, you know, and lots of people Happy. who, who, who uh, there's groups like Teen Challenger, I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Um, oh, yeah, Teen Challenger, excellent. Yeah, yeah they, they do. Excellent. I mean, they are seeing some amazing things happen in people's lives and uh, people like Jay Fallon and so on who are just, you know, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing stories of... Uh, uh, people's and we, and we see people like that here on the Costa del Sol in our church as well who who come in and are really in a place where they're at rock bottom and uh, you know they find help so like you say they, they need to go and find the help oh and, and and this is this is the thing why i i, I use the, the the self-help groups because i need a spiritual program and to see what i believe for this dave is that this addiction, all addiction, is a response to a deeper spiritual thirst. This is what I feel, that, 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 that what you're looking for is you're looking for something greater or bigger or some, some sort of meaning in life. And that when you get drug and alcohol free, you need to, you need to fill that void that you, you once filled with drugs and alcohol. You have to fill it with something, some sort of meaning or connection with a higher power or something that's going to that that basically will it, fill yeah. that hole inside i mean you went to bournemouth uh, and yeah the 12 step yeah. i mean we're not going to have time to yeah. go through the 12 steps but just give us a couple of the steps that just jump out at oh, you maybe that will oh, help, help other yeah. people oh yeah yeah so so the step that, and this is why i was saying about the meeting in fingerola because you've got a 12 step na meeting in fingerola um it, the, is the, the first step is we admitted we were powerless over our, our addiction and, and that our life had become unmanageable. Step two is we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And step three is we made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. Now, that's, that sounds like a, a, a religious program, but in fact, it's a spiritual program. But I, I went to Bournemouth and what happened to me there was I met... I mean, I mean it's crazy, really. But I met the, a council a councillor that I knew his family from a, a council estate in Glasgow. I mean, a very rough family too. And uh, and I knew what kind of life this councillor had been in his drug addiction. And he he was like, I mean, instrumental in me getting clean because he he when I got there, he says, "Listen, Mark, this is you need to get a program. If you do not get a program, believe me, this will kill you. Mm -hmm. This is an illness. It's progressive, and you have to have respect for the illness. You have to have respect for this condition, this disease. I mean, he called it disease, which is which is the term that they use in the, in the states. But I and you know, um, and I and I took and and I. I was really receptive to it because I, I got to a point, I think, Dave, with the fact is I was 32 years of age. I'd been using drugs for uh, continuously, daily, you know, copious amounts of drugs at times for 17 years, 18 years of my life. I had, you know, it was like almost I'd went into a party when I was 15 and I came out when I was 32. 
in between that time, I wound up in places like Ar- Ar- in prison, I wound up in India, and, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, I had some crazy, crazy, I, I mean, I, I got arrested once in Morocco, I mean, in the book, in the book there's some funny stories about things that happened to me when I was, you know, in Morocco and in, in India, and, you know, situations that you get yourself into, but, yeah. uh, yeah, uh, so so the steps the steps I practice and I continue and I still go to I still go to two or three meetings a week sometimes four meetings a week and the reason I go to it is because I need an ongoing I I, I feel that I, I'm part of a community that gives yeah. me a sort of connection and it also reminds me all the time because you you can forget after six I'm sixteen and a half years clean you you can it's a long time ago that I used drugs now and. You can almost forget how painful and how strong the obsession was. And by going to meetings, it reminds you. You hear people that are new, and it reminds you of why, why you, why you stopped. And I mean, you know, you're obviously helping other people as well. Uh, yeah. how, how do you feel when you come across people who maybe do they have to reach a point in life where it's make or break? Because uh, like you say, you reach rock bottom in every aspect of your life, and then you yeah, decide yeah. this is where it's all going to turn around. Do you ever come across people when you think, you know what, you're not ready yet because you haven't reached rock bottom yet, or you haven't reached that turning point, and you're just not ready? That you know, not that you don't want them to, but you just yeah. can see that they've not actually yeah. really got got the desire to change yet. Yeah, I know, and sometimes that's frustrating. Some some of my, so I can, I've had it with, with clients in the past where you know they come in because they're you know, their wife or their family members are saying, look, you need to do something, I'm going to leave you or I'm going to you, you disown you, or, you know, and, and they came in really to treatment for the wrong reasons, but hopefully when they come in, what I try and do is I try and plant a seed that they don't have to. I try. What I try and do is I try and smash through some of the person's denial. I try and challenge them and try and challenge the dysfunctional thinking, you know, the, the sort of deluded thinking about you know, uh, the, the drug use. I try and get them to look at the consequences of the drug. But of course, everybody's on different trajectories. Some people are still enjoying it. You know, that yeah. still people are they're using the drugs. I mean, this is what's funny is see the night that I got out of that prison, that hour in prison. They gave me my passport back. It's only last year or two years ago that I, I checked. I came back to Spain after all those years because they gave me my passport and I. And I just flew from from Spain, really, and I came back. And, and but but um, the night that I got out, they, I got out with this other Spanish guy. And the first thing this Spanish guy is, we were walking out the prison. He says, "Do you want to come to Fingarola and get some heroin?" <laughs> and and you know, I was, <laughs> I was like, "No, just like." But you know, my will was. I, I guess at that point, because I, I was sort of clean a wee bit, I I thought, oh. But of course, yeah. I went back to it a couple of days later. But, but I mean, it's it's um, yeah, it's just in- it's interesting. It's interesting doing this radio show. You know, thinking about that area and and the uh, and uh, you know what 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 I was like yeah. back then. Must, well. Yeah, because you're such a different person now, Mark. Oh uh, yeah, Mark. I really listen. I could be talking to you all day, but we've got to go to. I know, the same. Uh, but listen here. Uh, just what you're doing is brilliant because. Um, I, you, you're putting back into it. You change. You know, other people are yeah. going to be depending upon you now, and yeah. uh, you know, and that's where the difference is going to be. Uh, but Mark, it's great to hear that you've uh, changed your life around because we do hear a lot about people who die in the middle of being a drug addict, who die. Uh, you know, um, oh, all the time. Yeah, it, it's good to also hear that there's people like you who who have. Uh, have got a gr- grasp of it and said, you know what, it's not going to rule me anymore. Uh, listen, no. Mark, if anybody wants to get the book, it's called Nothing to Declare, and it's, uh, just remind me, it's Confessions of an Unsuccessful... Of, of an unsuccessful... Drug, drug dealer... Is a, uh, no, a Confessions <laughs> of an Unsuccessful dealer, uh, smuggler, dealer, and addict... Uh, I've just wrote, no, drug dealer... <laughs> So I, well, I just, if they put those words in, they'll find the book, won't they? <laughs> I, they'll find the book. You'll find the book. Just put Mark Dempster, Amazon. If you just put even Mark Dempster into Amazon UK, I, I'll come up. But it'll come up. Nothing to declare really? right away. And uh, and also, I just wanted to say before you go, David, uh, that now I've got children. I've got two children who have yeah. never seen me use drugs really? or alcohol. You know, so so they're like the next. I broke the chain of addiction, the transgenerational. Yeah. I, I guess. 
uh, influences from from my childhood, which is fab. Thank you, Dave. It was a great great ha- talk. Having children is another life changing moment as well. Take oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Listen, Mark. Thank you. All the best. I will, I will keep in touch with you because it may be that we need I, to uh, uh, network with you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, definitely yeah. do. Okay. Do do definitely. Che- cheers, okay, Mark. Then. Have a great afternoon. Che- uh, I still love Easter. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs> uh, uh, Mark, Mark Dempster there, back in the UK, and he knows Spain very well. Uh, thanks for coming on, Mark. Appreciate you being honest and uh, giving us your story and your account of what's uh, happened in your life. It's TRE Talk Radio Europe, and uh, it's 11 minutes to six, and we've got to take a quick break. 